from the first time that I came here to the U.S. in 93, it's just a completely different country to me. You fly in any airline now and you hear all the instructions both in English and Spanish. I've seen Spanish 101 and Spanish 102 classes go from maybe 20 sections per semester to 30 this semester. They see it all around, so they think it's, it's something that they might want to use, that there's something that they might use in the future. Most people perceive light-skinned individuals with straight hair as people who speak Spanish, but you'll be surprised. When people look at me, they think that I'm African-American until I talk. <laughs> The Spanish language is heard all over the United States. Just as with English, there exists an impressive diversity among the dialects spoken here. Historic Mexican Spanish can be found in areas where, as the saying goes, the border crossed the people, when much of the southwestern United States was acquired in the mid-19th century. Over time, immigrants have introduced newer varieties of Spanish from all corners of Mexico. Multiple generations of Cubans and Puerto Ricans have immigrated in significant numbers for more than 70 years. Continued migration from these and 22 other Spanish-speaking countries has resulted in a culturally diverse population in the United States. In addition to the historically populated Southwest, urban areas such as Chicago, New York, and Miami have long been associated with large Spanish-speaking populations. More recently, over the past several decades, the southeastern U.S. has been newly transformed by the addition of Spanish-speaking peoples. Well, it's grown a lot. It's become uh, more diversified, uh, more sophisticated, I think, more diverse in people and uh, activities, quite a, bit, quite a bit of changes. When I came, I looked like a, everybody would look at me. They didn't know if I was black and white. They, there wasn't many Hispanics in this area, so it has changed a lot. The community was mainly um, Caucasian and African American, and there were no uh, Mexican store at all in the area. And now, everywhere you go, you'll find Mexican stores. It is definitely more venues now. There's like about one, two, three, four, five clubs that I can think of on the top of my head. There is always something to do on the weekends here. Uh, that Latin dance wise, so that's that's good. There's uh, places that are opening up downtown for us now because uh, back in the days, I mean, we, we couldn't get in these spots downtown. I think like the band itself is a product of what's happening in North Carolina, basically. Like, like you were saying, why now? It's like, why not? Why not? Everybody we had here. the ingredients. Yeah, it was because yeah. basically it right got now. together. Yeah, everybody was here. You know, you call this guy, bro. What are you doing? What are you doing? Bro, bro, bro. Let's play in this band. You know, it was just nothing. I mean, right. 20 years ago, they just they, right. they couldn't, it couldn't happen. When I came here, there were no Latinos. It was very rare to see a Latino. Now, wherever you go, there are Latinos. The reason why I came to this country is because this country gives a lot of opportunities to one, although you have to work for those dreams, but you have an opportunity to improve and to be something of yourself. We're seeing a lot more migration from other American cities right now rather than immigration from Mexico. And that's kind of a recent phenomenon. Um, I think what happened in the early 90s and talking to the demographers around and, and the people who were here, you had a big wave of um, a labor force that came in for the construction jobs and the agricultural jobs. And that first recent arrival, first generation Hispanic was the first to really populate the area. What we're seeing today is a much bigger influx of a white-collar, professional-level Hispanic that are moving in from Miami and New York, and in my case, Dallas. Solamente, realmente, tenemos más o menos 20 años de ser una comunidad de muchos inmigrantes. Y pienso que todavía necesitamos más tiempo a entender que realmente somos una comunidad muy diversa. Sí, algunos sí están entendiendo eso ahora, pero yo creo que con el tiempo que cuando los hijos de inmigrantes nacidos aquí llegan a ser 
padres y madres y tener sus hijos, que vamos a, a tener más de una mezcla, porque ellos pueden hablar el inglés perfectamente. It's just such a rapidly growing, changing yeah, uh, community. Yeah. So many people arriving from different places. Mm -hmm. uh, Ramon arrived not directly from the Dominican Republic, but from Canada. Montreal, yeah. yeah Montreal, yeah. you know, like all people coming to this area because it's uh, vibrant and because there's a good economy. Well, the economy, the economy. People you know. are coming from all over the place and that creates a mixture of people like you don't see in very many places. Right. Right. It's funny because even though we're both Latin America, South America, and Central America, the cultures are a little bit different. Americans tend to say Hispanics are just from the border down. And with the exception of Brazil, we're just the same. And we're really not. We're very, very different from Northern Latin America, which is closer to Mexico, to the Caribbean region, to South America. And, you know, there's a lot of variety, even the way we speak the same language. The accents are different. And if you are Hispanic, you pick it up. You know, like when you're American, you know somebody's from Boston versus California. You know, I could tell you somebody from Costa Rica versus Puerto Rico versus Dominican. Uh, the only one I have a little bit of problem with is Nicaragua, for instance. I don't see enough of Nicaraguans. So sometimes I'm like, um, you know, I hear something different about what country are you from? I mean, sometimes you hear a word that it's completely new to you. In Colombia, prontuario means like a rap sheet. You know, your police record, you've been in jail, that's your prontuario. But this woman was using prontuario to describe how she was de developing her syllabus for the next, for next semester. So she said prontuario, and I turned around, the other guy turned around, well, why do you use that? One word, <laughs> and the I just thought thinking. This, I'm not sure, but there's a, for the word skirt yeah. in, in Argentina, <laughs> they say pochera, and then for, I guess, North, North America, mm -hmm. Central America, Central. that area, they say Falda. falda. So, like, sometimes when I, I don't, I don't remember how that conversation came up, but I, I used that word and I said pochera, and they didn't know what I was talking about because of that. Pochera, pochera. And also pochera, pollo is like a, the basic word for chicken, for us, pollo. And she comes and says something about pochera, we sound like where the, all the chickens, you know, like the farm or what, pochera. And she's like, no, this pochera, I'm like, okay, la falda. El lenguaje de nosotros es, eh, nos comemos las R's y las S's, no las pronunciamos, no nos pronunciamos las R's ni las R's. Entonces, cuando uno, cuando nosotros ahora, cuando llegamos a, ¿no? a este país, cuando nos juntamos con las otras uh, razas, los sudamericanos, entonces tenemos que pronunciarla porque no, no nos queremos sentir inferior. Es que, que un, no nos entienden también. Eh, no nos entienden, entonces sí. ya cuando más o menos, pues ya, y se nos hace difícil porque es un poquito, eh, como que hay que coger un poco más de aire. Para pronunciar. No, en change. Hay que cambiar la personalidad. Yeah, hay que, la personalidad Cuando porque. Uno habla, habla, eh, ya cambia, ya no parece, yeah. ya, ya tú no suena dominicano, puertorriqueño. puertorriqueño. Cuando tú pronuncias la R y la S, ya no suena a puertorriqueño. <risa> ya todo el mundo, todo el mundo dice, no es de tú eres, tú no eres puertorriqueño porque tú no, tú, tú estás, tú no te, tú estás pronunciando las, las R's. With someone like Sophie exposed to so many variations of Spanish, you know, from Mexico, Colombia, España, and, and you know, where, wherever else she's picking up her, <laughs> her Spanish. So I'm kind of curious, like, what will her Spanish be like, you know, 20 years from now? I have a brother that came to school here. He graduated, he got a master's here, and, and, and he speaks Spanish. His daughter doesn't speak Spanish at all. Immigrants lose their native language a lot faster than most people think. We're in the U.S. and, and, and English is the predominant language, therefore it's, in, it, it's inevitable that when the children go to school that, that, that English becomes their predominant language. I had to completely forget about my Spanish background to focus mainly on my, um, to learn English. Because I remember when I was in California, one of my ESL teachers told me that in order for me to learn English, I had to sleep, eat, drink, everything had to be English. And, I, you know, and that was my main goal. 
One of the things that happens is that you have um, children who speak Spanish up until the time they're six, they grow up in their home when they're very young, speaking Spanish with their parents. They get to the school system, they feel a lot of pressure to speak English, they learn English, and then they start to feel pressure to speak only English. So maybe around the time they're in third grade or so, they start refusing to speak Spanish at home, and then they actually lose it. We have a program here that we have, we seek over 180 kids. What we're noticing, which is really sad, is that the children prefer English over Spanish. And that's part of wanting to belong. You know, if you live in a country that everybody speaks English, you want to speak English. You want to look like other people. When I'm with my family, they don't understand that good in, in, in English. So sometimes I talk them English, but I talk them little English. And at school, I have to talk English. Hablamos más el español para que nuestros hijos aprendan el español porque ellos ven mucho inglés, entonces ellos hablan más inglés que nosotros. Sí, porque el inglés lo aprendes en la escuela, pero el español no. Así que es mejor aprender el español en casa. Sí, él es mi sobrino y no sabe muchas cosas en español, casi todas las hablan en inglés. I do want to learn Spanish and not fall into that stereotype as like a like someone that doesn't want to represent their heritage. I mean, I still want to know about it, and I mean, it would be kind of cool to go to my, like, grandfather and, like, speak it to him. I'm sure he'll be very proud if I did do that, because, like, he knows that my, like, his, the daughters that he has, like, none of them can speak Spanish fluently. None of his grandkids can speak, like, Spanish at all. I always, I guess, knew how to speak Spanish well and read it and write it. Um, so it wasn't as necessary for my parents to, I guess, force me to learn Spanish or keep the language because I've, I've kept it. Um, but it was harder for my younger sisters who grew up with me and my sister speaking English to them and we're doing everything in English, so it was hard for them to, to pick up and keep the, the Spanish. When I was little and I spoke Spanish and then I started speaking more and more English, my mother would actually say to me, you know, after I'd been talking for a while, and she'd say, okay, now tell me the rest of the story in Spanish. And she'd make me switch. And, you know, I'd roll my eyes and I thought it was annoying. But now I'm an adult and I'm, I'm a bilingual speaker. It's something that you pass on to your, your children. Uh, that sense of pride for mm -hmm. the culture and the language, it's passed on from the parents to the kids. It's a way for me to connect with the culture. It's something that I'm very now very proud of. Uh, making sure that I can speak uh, both English and Spanish is critical for me as a professional, but it's also indicative of my pride that I have in my culture. She had a hard time, and it was hard for me trying to help her, and I couldn't do it because I was in, I mean, the same situation, I couldn't speak English. Yeah, because I couldn't understand. Like, I'd come home and I'd, like, start crying because I couldn't. I did the same thing. <laughs> it was hard having that sense that um, I have to speak it because I have to. Um, and there are some people who don't speak it because it's not perfect, because I had an accent too. So I was like, they're going to make fun of me because I have an accent. People think it's funny to, to try to understand somebody who's trying to learn their language. And I love it, most of them, because they were uh, smiling and, and telling me, oh, OK, you're trying to say this. And at right that moment, I listened to the, the word, and I kept it in my mind, and I put it in my tongue the next time I had to use it. The thing that I think that made it easy for me was that I, I, I let them, I, I used to let my customer know since the beginning that I was learning, and that I was doing, doing it by myself. So my customer usually became, <laughs> became my teachers. Some, sometimes, I, I thought that maybe I, I could I, I would not un, uh, learn English, but I don't stop. I have only one year studying in school, but uh, I have um, 
two years and a half uh, watching TV in English, listening radio program in, in English, uh, reading all kinds of magazines that I can get on libraries, uh, CDs, books. On weekend that I don't work, I spend uh, usually three, four, five hours every day of Sunday and Saturday reading and listening programs in English. Pues a mí me gustaría hablar este inglés, pero la verdad, afortunadamente no, no sé. Pero sí me, me gustaría para para hacer esto algo más más fácil con los con los americanos, ¿verdad? Para entendernos con ellos, porque a veces nos hablan y no, no, no nos entendemos. Hay muchos que sí quieren aprender el inglés. Hay, hay algunos que, que tienen problemas con eso. Um, están trabajando muchas horas o tienen que cuidar sus niños. O, o el, el sentimiento de que, que no puedo, no, no tengo la, la habilidad. There are a lot of personal, uh, social, demographic, features that go into determining how quickly people will learn a language. But having said that, you know, we also have to understand that there's this natural cycle in which, uh, and which is often difficult for first generation speakers to completely learn the language fluently. Second generation speakers are often bilingual and by the time they're third generation speakers, the new language, English, would be the dominant language and then it becomes and then it becomes a struggle to keep this important heritage alive by maintaining Spanish. I think uh, they need to learn English but I think we need to learn uh, Spanish also and I think there's a lot of satisfaction that you get out of being able to communicate with uh, other people. Uh, as I understand the Statistics, there are about a 500 million Spanish-speaking people in the world, and it just makes you feel uh, uh, a great sense of satisfaction to be able to communicate even a, in a limited way with that many people in the world. Mi esposo, él entiende un poco, pero dice que no necesita hablar español. Eso me dijo a varios años, pero hoy eso ha cambiado porque él mira que es, uh, es muy importante hablar español hoy aquí en este estado o en este país. Entonces hoy sí desea hablar español. The first time I had to speak with a Spanish person at work and try to explain to them that I need to draw some blood, I need to do an electrocardiogram, and that language barrier just trying to tell them what I needed and they didn't speak any English and I didn't speak any Spanish, that's it's kind of hard. If you can speak a little Spanish and they can speak a little English and get along a lot better and that cuts down on like the stereotypes and a lot of people have a lot of fears and like stereotypes about Spanish. If they learn a little bit of Spanish then they can get along with them a little bit more. I had one student, you know, this really heavy guy, you know, fireman, he walked in and, you know, he had a very heavy North Carolina accent. But when he started speaking Spanish, he did it with such a ease. So in the middle of the class, he was new that day, and I was like, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah. And I said, are you around Hispanics? He said, yes, all the time. He says, you know, my part-time job is construction, so. And I said, he said, how do you know? I said, I could tell. With the ease, you just pronunciation and stuff. You know, and the other people, I said, can you see, guys, if you are working with Hispanics, you know, your ear is already used to it. A lot of my Spanish and like my first introduction to immigrant community was when I actually was waiting tables working in restaurants because everyone in the kitchen, um, the dishwashers, the cooks, everyone was from Mexico. So that's actually where I learned most of my Spanish that I use. Um, just being around people, getting to know them, becoming friends. And I found out that a lot of the textbook Spanish I used I, when I was in high school was very useful for me, but that was not really how people spoke, of course. Two people from Guatemala came up and spent a few days here, and I had them as a guest in my house. And because of that uh, experience, and the frustration and the interest, I started trying to learn Spanish. And uh, that was a very slow process for me. But to become proficient, it just takes patience, I think. 
some people pick up languages much easier than others. My goal was when Sophie started to grow up was to learn Spanish with Sophie, but as you soon realize a kid will, is like a sponge, and will learn it so much faster. And I thought I'd be reading and talking with her when in fact she, you know, within a day passed me and then refused to talk to me because it was such a chore, you know. She <laughs> Yeah, could, she, she switches talk. back and forth from Spanish to English like it's the same language. Because we were born on the Texas side, we don't really know where in Mexico we came from, but, but we know that that's our culture. And so we grew up in a world half English, half Spanish. But when we went to first grade, we didn't know any English whatsoever because the native tongue was Spanish. So we had to start from there. From first grade on, we learned what the American culture was all about. It's always been a mixed family since, you know, we were raised in America, but we still have those, I guess you'd say, Latino cultures. We know language represents identity, and it's one of these cases that are so neat where language perfectly represents identity. By mixing two languages, you get a mixed way of speaking that mirrors the identity of a person who feels that they're, they're part of two different cultures. We call that code switching. Um, Spanglish is just the term that the community gives to that, to a mixing of Spanish and English. People tend to think that when they hear someone speaking Spanglish that they either don't speak English or Spanish well or, or something like that, but in fact that's not true. In order to do a code switched variety, in order to speak Spanglish, you have to know both Spanish and English. We always talk like that. It's like I say something in English and then I come and say something in Spanish. And you don't mean it, it just... It's just half English, yeah. half Spanish. And it's, yeah. It sounds right for us though. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds right. I still do that when I speak with my family, is half the sentence may be in Spanish, half the sentence may be in English, and uh, that's how we communicate. Uh, so it's, it's truly bilingual, where people understand both languages. I've only five years here, and despite that I haven't forgotten the Spanish, there are phrases that I speak in English better. Y en otros, en otros casos es más fácil cuando uno está, por ejemplo, escribiendo, como chatting online, cuando uno está escribiendo, mm -hmm. <laughs> cuando uno está escribiendo, eh, le es más fácil poner una palabra en inglés porque es más corta. Entonces, yo creo que de ahí se deriva que las personas empiecen a hablar Spanish, más que nada. Es muy común cuando sabes dos lenguajes y a veces solo dices, hey, ¿qué pasó? ¿Sabes cómo fue? ¿Cómo fue ayer? ¿Te vi? No, cosas así. Pero he notado entre mis amigos they used some words from English and they uh, um, translated or used it into the Spanish in a way that is not English, is not Spanish. Like uh, Wachale. Wachale is wash out. It comes from, from the watch out in English and fíjate. Mira lo que haces in, in Spanish. Uh, uh, so they mixed the, sen the, the sense or the meanings and uh, getting in, into this, this word wachale, it's, it's kind of funny, but it works for them. The unique aspect of learning English in the Southeast is the particular mixture of uh, Spanish features with Southern features. So for example, in some areas of the southeast, Spanish speakers are picking up the southern vowel of I, so the time is pronounced as tam, or North Carolina is pronounced as North Carolina, all right, which is sort of the indigenous rural southern way of speaking. In other areas, they may not do that, and part of that is who they associate with, how they adapt to their social context, and how they feel about themselves as they relate to this new language and uh, a new identity in the southern United States. I still got relatives in, in, in New York, and uh, it's amazing. They say, you have a southern accent. That's right. I said, what? I said, yeah, you sound southern. I said, what? Well, I've been here 22 years, so maybe I do, and I don't recognize that. I do. If I go to Houston, they already know where I'm from. Oh, you're from North Carolina, because the way I speak. You know, so I guess they can tell, and I can tell. You know, and I'm like, how can you tell, you know? Sometimes I wish I, w I lose my accent, 
you know, guys like you and if I speak on the phone, oh, hey, Marie, I'm like, how you know it's me? Well. <laughs> Speaking English, I've definitely picked up the y'all, um, which everybody tries to correct you on and ain't. Um, um, maybe a lot of the words, maybe I pick up with a southern drawl anyway. I know I'm Mexican, whatever, uh, to whatever degree that might be. That's where my family's from. I speak Spanish. I still eat Mexican food at home and, you know, there's definitely a lot of things in, in the way I, I think and uh, do things that are always going to be stuck to me being Mexican. So it's a mixture of cultures. Working at Chick-fil-A, I've gotten to hear, like, people from around, like, different places. And when they, they always tell us how when they come in there and hear our accents, I think it's so funny because it's so different from up there, like, where they live. There's just one lady from England, and she trips, like, she has a, like, she just so, like, thinks it's so funny whenever she hears us talk. <laughs> so, but she has a different accent, too. <laughs> Cuando en la vida se sufre una herida porque se pierde sangre querida en ese momento coge el que tiene en tus manos y echa para adelante mi hermano con la ayuda de nueva sangre Cuando en el alma se siente un dolor por la traición que te brinde un amigo